Hello and welcome to this video. This video is going to be called 10 Essential Jazz Artists. Not jazz fusion artists, not prog artists, but proper jazz artists. So many of you watching this channel are fans of prog, many of you are fans of jazz fusion. And I'm sh sure that you've skirted around the edges of real jazz, proper jazz, for many years. Uh, this month I would like to focus on jazz as an art form, which of course is a huge art form. It's an art form that spans the whole of the 20th century. It's an art form that spawns all the other popular music forms of the 20th century. It runs from very popular music like Artie Shaw, Benny Goodman, Ella Fitzgerald, and even people like Frank Sinatra and, and Bing Crosby. All those really have come out of jazz. And it all goes all the way to avant-garde music like Cecil Taylor, Archie Shepp, Abba Ayla. So it's, it's, it's a big genre to get your head into. Also, of course, we're going back to recordings that in some cases are nearly 100 years old. And so uh, some of the recording quality is, is quite difficult for a modern listener to get their ears around. But I think there's so much to be gained from really understanding what the essential jazz musicians did, uh, what their input in, was to jazz history, and really developing an appreciation for their genius, because these people are the geniuses on which all the music we like was created. So jazz begins at the end of the 19th century. It's a, it's a living form. It's an improvisatory form. And so we don't really know that much about it until it starts to get recorded. It's not like classical music where you can look at a Bach or Beethoven score, right? We're aware of artists that happened, that were around before the advent of recording, um, but we don't know anything about them. This includes um, artists like Buddy Bolden, who were really the first jazz musicians right at the turn of the century. Around about 1917, 1916, 1917, they started recording jazz. The first recorded jazz was a, a white New Orleans group called the original Dixieland Jazz Band. Um, that was a huge success, so the record companies started to record more jazz. I believe that jazz was greatly affected by recording, because before recording, I think jazz was possibly a sort of um, collective improvisational form where people jazz jammed on tunes of the day. Of course, once you step into a recording studio, you need to start to organise the music. You need to be able to make it land in, so it will fit on the side of a 78 recording. There's another incredible musicians that emerge at the beginning of jazz doing this. I would think uh, Jelly Roll Morton would be one, King Oliver would be one. Um, Fletcher Henderson with, with the first big band would be a, a very uh, important early jazz musician. But of course the genius of this period and the genius tw of 20th century music and the greatest genius of jazz, the king, is of course Louis Armstrong. Now um, Louis Armstrong is, is a giant. All right, and um, because he had hit records right up until his death in 1971, we see him as almost like an entertainer. But this guy's a heavyweight in terms of uh, music history. He's first recorded in King Oliver's band in the early 1920s, and then um, he starts to run his own group and he does a series of recordings called the Hot Fives and Hot Sevens, and that's the album I've pulled up to represent that. This is a work of genius. All the musicians heard this and they heard what Louis was doing on this. And what was Louis doing? Well, primarily it was his own playing, right? His sound, his phrasing, his tone really dictates what jazz is going to be like. Um, the way he swings, the way he phrases, every musician is going to copy him. Saxophone players are going to copy him. Pianists are going to copy him. Drummers are going to copy him. But he also organizes the music. He actually carves out places for solos, he changes the direction, he changes the feel, he changes the orchestration and he really does this on the Hot Fives and Hot Seven recording. Um, so many musicians on this list were greatly affected by hearing those recordings. Um, I was just reading about the great Billie Holiday and how she, when she heard West End Blues and she heard the clarinet solo with accompanying scatting vocal that runs alongside it, when she heard that vocal that's what wanted that's what made her want to sing and she based her vocal style on that scatting Louis Armstrong vocals. I think it's Louis Armstrong, it might be somebody else on that actually. Um, Louis Armstrong then went on to run big bands throughout the 30s and 40s. 
ending up with his All Stars in the 1940s, and he carried on making incredible music. Um, for those who want to approach Louis Armstrong, any period is, is incredible because you've got his soloing. Now, um, his soloing is he, the way to approach listening to Louis Armstrong, I think, is to listen to the way he uses contrast. Right, so he will play a phrase and that will be a very arpeggiated, almost like a sort of um, uh, a bugle um, fanfare. And then he might do some very chromatic jazz lines. Then he might just use pure noise, okay? And the way he uses those different ways of improvisation, you can see how he is busting open jazz improvisation, okay? Um, I mentioned Fletcher Henderson, he, he was running a big band in the 1920s. As the jazz recordings became more popular, we, we move into the big band era. And there's two giants of this, this period that we really need to get our heads around. The first being, of course, the mighty Duke Ellington. This is the album I grew up with as a kid. This is my dad's album, which is a sort of best of. And when you read a best of by Duke Ellington, you're really basically reading out jazz standards. Take the Ain Train, Perdido, Mood Indigo, Black and Tan Fantasy, Solitude, The Mooch, Sophisticated Lady, Creole Love Call. That's just a, the tracks on this album. So what does Duke Ellington do? Well, he comes in like, he's the great composer and orchestrator. He really shows how you can compose using jazz. Um, so one of the things that... Um, well, let's let's have a look at it like this. There's three things that jazz really brings to uh, music. One of them is something we mentioned: swing, groove. Um, the other is um, improvisation. Okay, how do you create compositions where there's improvisation within the compositions? Okay, and how do you use improvisation? But the other is an individual sound. If you're a classical music musician, you've been trained to create a certain type of sound, a sound which uh, the composer can predict. In jazz we don't have that. If Johnny Hodges in Count Basie sat, stands up and plays a C, he sounds like Johnny Hodges playing a C, whereas Paul, if Paul Consalzi plays an E of that C major chord, he uh, sounds like him. <laughs> and so um, what Duke Ellington does is he starts to create very complex classical music level compositions that utilize the musicians of the band. So he's not just hearing that C, he's hearing Johnny Hodges. Um, and he actually creates pieces where the melodies will be played by certain instrumentalists and they will be allowed to bend, you, like in the same way as Louis Armstrong would bend a melody. He would allow them to bend it, but constrain it within um, a very tight orchest orchestration. Louis Armstrong is the great orchestrator, he's the great composer of jazz. Um, the other big band that you need to listen to is Count Basie. Now, I've, I've searched out the album that I grew up with, and it's lost its cover at some point. It's, it's this album, and it's called From Broadway to Paris. That's the album there. Count Basie, right, um, he, he's um, the great swing and um, groove musician of jazz. He really creates, I think, the basis of the modern rhythm section of guitar, bass and drums. Um, his rhythm section was, and I'm just checking I get this right, the classic rhythm section was, in the early 30s, Freddie Green on guitar, who never played a solo in his life, he just played rhythm guitar, the incredible Joe, Joe Jones on drums, who was so important in taking the groove from the snare drum or, or traps, contraptions, which is how jazz was played in the 1920s, down onto the hi-hats. And Walter Page, who was one of the, not the originator of the walking bass line, but he was the one who brought it into that rhythm section. And that rhythm section was so important to developing the modern rhythm section, the funky groove. If you listen to Count Basie in the 1930s, you can hear rock and roll going on in that rhythm section. Uh, Count Basie also brought, brought a number of soloists up with him in that band. He came out of Kansas City, and Kansas City is gonna be very important for the development of jazz, as we'll see in a minute. Um, but 
he brings in Lester Young, and Lester Young, along with Coleman Hawkins, are the two great saxophone players from the 1930s, and those two really push the virtuosity aspect of jazz forward, but they also bring the focus from the trumpet of Lee Armstrong onto the saxophone. That's all going on in Count Basie's band. Um, who have we got next? The swing era also ushers in the jazz singer. Now jazz singers um, really come out of the big sort of travelling blues singers like Bessie Smith, okay, who have this big like almost like operatic voice. But in the um, early 30s, Billie Holiday comes out and Billie Holiday has learnt, by listening to Louis Armstrong, she's learnt how to use the mic, okay? The, suddenly when you've got a mic up in front of you, you can sing in a much more intimate way. Billie Holiday wasn't a powerhouse, she didn't have a huge range, but she knew how to phrase and she knew how to bend the notes and she would do that in a very up close and personal. Billie Holiday is, is, is the queen of, of jazz vocals as far as I'm concerned but she spawns a whole bunch of um, different jazz singers the singer that manages to put all that together that Bessie Smith power with the Billie, Billie Holiday and really be able to cover all those bases is incredible Ella Fitzgerald right this is the album I grew up with this is one of the songbook albums that she made with Nelson Riddle, which was her with an orchestra singing beautiful versions, almost like the definitive versions of different jazz standards. But um, uh, Ella could get up and jam with a with a jazz group. She could get down and dirty and soulful. She could sing rock and roll. She could sing soul. She could sing the blues. Ella could do absolutely everything. I grew up with Ella Fitzgerald. Um, if she's on the radio, the instant, the first whisper I hear of Ellis Fitzgerald, it goes right into my system. Uh, she's just one of the great singers. An absolute natural, you know, discovered at a very young age when she went to a dance competition, uh, I think in New York, and uh, she chickened out, so she got thrust into the singing competition and uh, just won it. And from there on, she just captivated so many people and sold millions and millions of records. So we have Ella Fitzgerald there, essential musician. Um, the success of the swing era and big band couldn't last and it was really curtailed by the Second World War when a lot of the people who were playing in these bands got enlisted and it was difficult to put large groups together. There's a whole bunch of other factors but what you see is um, we go from big bands down to small groups um, and when these small groups start to happen and the new generations start to come in, they start to experiment and they almost want to create a music form which alienates the, the um, generation that went before and they do that by um, creating a, f a much more complex um, way of playing music um, where they would take popular music tunes, take the chord pro progressions but reorchestrate them. This is called the bebop movement. There's a whole ton of musicians that are so important in the development of this movement, like Charlie Christian, Thelonious Monk, Ken, Kenny Clark, um, a whole ton of them, Dizzy Gillespie. But the guy that is the sort of Louis Armstrong of bebop, the guy that comes in and provides how you phrase the sound, you know, the whole rhythmical impetus is, of course, the genius that is Charlie Parker. So Charlie Kapar comes out in the 40s. This is a, a, an album that I had had for Christmas when I was 15 years old and it just absolutely floored me. His virtuosity, this is a guy from Kansas City. He's, he's really coming out of that movement. In Kansas City they used to do a thing where they would play in one time and they would play double the time. This is a, like an inversion of what Louis Armstrong used to do. Louis Armstrong would play very, very fast but when he actually played he would play a half-time feel which just creates this beautiful you know, bouncy music, uh, but with bebop, it's like the in, in inversion of that. Charlie Parker um, discovered a way of playing by taking the upper intervals of the chords rather than the first, third, fifth. He would take the ninth, the you know, the um, sharp eleven and the thirteenth, uh, and he would weave melodies like that. And he f he said once he discovered this, he felt like he could fly, which is partly where he got his nickname Bird. Um, this is one of the classic um, later quintets with Miles Davis, J.J. Johnson, Max Roach, 
Before that he had the, 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 the classic quintet or quartet with Dizzy Gillespie. I'm going to do a video um, pretty soon on Charlie Parker where I can get into more detail with him. Um, one of the great geniuses of the bebop era was Thelonious Monk. Here we have him here. But Th Thelonious Monk's going his own route. He's really influenced by Duke Ellington. He's, he's really influenced by Duke Ellington's way of playing piano. He's very influenced by the blues. But Duke, um, uh, Thelonious Monk is one of the first true originals of jazz who really carves up their own world. Right? Because of that, it was difficult for him to find success throughout the 40s and 50s. It get, got a, a long time for him to be recognised. He, he didn't play flowing lines and fast lines like Charlie Parker. Right? He didn't play those big bright melodies like Louis Armstrong. Instead he played in a much more angular way where we would often hit two notes together a semitone apart, really hinting at microtones in between the notes. And those microtones are really coming out of the idea of the blues. Um, he wrote so many jazz standards. This is the album that I grew up with. I bought this when I was a youngster. And if I just read out the tunes he wrote, like Well You Needn't, Mysterioso, Bencher Swing, Round Midnight, Epistrophe, Ruby My Dear, Creep School with Nelly, <coughs> Blue Monk, Straight No Chaser. He's like, he's like um, Duke Ellington. You know, he's, he is a true originator, a true great composer and an incredible improviser. Another guy to emerge from the bebop movement, which is who is probably after Louis, Duke Ellington and Charlie Parker, the probably the fourth most important jazz musician of the 20th century and definitely the most um, important jazz musician from say the 1950 onwards, <laughs> which is most of popular music, would be Miles Davis. Uh, and Miles Davis is one of the originators of fusion because Miles Davis couldn't stand still. He had to keep keep pushing the music forward. He comes out in the 1940s. He's quite an introverted player. He's got this beautiful, lonely, alienated sound that will turn even the sweetest pop tune into something else, um, which is far more melancholic. Um, and he takes that sound... And on his first album, The Birth of Cool, he sort of orchestrates that with Gil Evans into the next sort of sound of jazz, which is the cool jazz of the 1950s. Um, he becomes interested in modal ideas. He slowly moves away from the reliance on the chord changes to modes. By the 60s, with the classic quintet, he um, is working on a sort of time no changes. It's his own version of free jazz. And once he's in that sort of modal time no changes, it's very he easy for him to accommodate popular music and rock music, which he does on albums like Bitches Brew. And of course, his channel is just full of videos which look at that period. So I'm going to move on from there because you can check this whole tons of videos about Miles Davis on here. Um, another great musician of the um, 1950s, who was another original, another musician really influenced by, by Duke Ellington, who is as much a composer as a player, is Charlie Mingus. But Charlie Mingus was a player. This guy was um, a virtuoso jazz double bass player that came out of the bebop era. He then um, he joined Lionel Hampton's band. He, he went quite a sort of traditional route. He formed an incredible trio with Red Norvo and Tal Farlow. Then he formed his own group. And... Um, Charlie Mingus goes back to the idea of collective improvisation and he orchestrates collective improvisation in a really wonderful way. On this album he does it brilliantly on um, Isabel's Table Dance, which is like a 10 minute incredible piece. This, this album is sort of like a concept album. He's really exploring sort of Spanish um, themes. Um, he has some incredible players in his band, for example, Eric Dolphy. And so we see the beginnings of free improvisation in this with the uh, Mingus and those ideas were carried on by the incredible Ornette Coleman uh, the Ornette Coleman came out in the late 50s and that called The Shape of Jazz to Come um, he wrote tunes that had chord progressions but he would not favour the harmonic structure over the rhythmical structure of the tune or his own ideas or rhythmical ideas. It's it's a it's a concept called harmonics, you know, which really is the idea of of improvising totally. 
So if you start to develop an idea and you want to follow that idea, you follow that idea. If it's not, it's, it's a way of breaking out of the tyranny of the chord progression. As he develops this, he moves into free jazz. And in the 70s, he actually moves into fusion. I've pulled out this album, which many fusion fans here will know. And that's a good place to start for Ornette Coleman. Okay, and the last essential jazz musician on my list on this whistle stop tour is of course the incredible John Coltrane. John Coltrane came up through the bebop era, he was actually playing with Dizzy Gillespie in the 1940s. Um, his drug habit kept him out of the music scene throughout the 50s, but eventually he, he ends up in the Thelonious Monk band and then the Miles Davis band. He actually flits between the two and those modal ideas of um, Miles Davis combined with his Coltrane matrix which is a way of taking the 2-5-1 which is the harmonic structure of jazz and busting opens which he did on tracks like Countdown and Giant Steps. He moves into free jazz uh, as well. A completely different approach to free jazz um, as, as Ornette Coleman. Um, and he ended up making this album, which is a pretty out there free jazz album, but he's also sold millions because it's so beautiful. And of course, that's where you start with uh, John Coltrane. So you can see how fast I've had to go to try and compress all that into uh, one video. But I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you, it gave you a little insight into 10 musicians that you could go and check out now. And I'm going to now, on the following videos on this channel, really start to explore some of this jazz stuff and get heavy into the jazz. So... If you're ready to go down deeper, keep watching and I'll see you on the next video.